I think a lot of people enjoy reading from John. So he wrote the Gospel of John, which is the life of Jesus, and he also wrote this letter, the first John, actually second John, third John, but uh, these letters that he is writing to people, as well as the Gospel, is for the purpose of trying to encourage people to know Christ, to know the truth about Christ, uh, for the people that are already following Christ, that they would know him better and that their faith would even be stronger. And uh, appreciate the song that Matt read, uh, that he sang, sorry, about uh, walking in sunlight, because I didn't choose that. I didn't choose the Bible reading that uh, Joey read, but uh, the song Walking in Sunlight, because uh, that is a very a strong picture, word picture that uh, John uses, both in the gospel and even in this letter about uh, the light and that we're walking down a path and trying to be in the light of God uh, through Jesus Christ. And so, kind of just beginning in the book of 1 John, he's writing, trying to encourage the people. Sometimes there was false doctrine that was being taught, and that seemed to be fairly universal in all the different churches. Uh, that's something Paul had to write a lot about. Uh, there was people that were struggling with their faith, whether we, we should continue following Christ or not. And there were people that were also struggling with we, which something we'd call worldliness, of just you know living, trying to live for Christ, and yet also being really influenced by the world as well. So in this short letter, five chapters, uh, he tries to cover uh, several of those issues. But to do that, he really has to set the foundation of who he is and why he has authority. Because obviously if you have false teachers, they try to establish their own authority and their own credibility to say, you know, I am uh, somebody who uh, has a new revelation or I'm somebody who has a lot of knowledge or I've been educated or I've visited with somebody and they've, you know, given me a lot of uh, really great things that I want to share with you. And that's how people sometimes are led astray by false teaching and false teachers. And so he has to perhaps begin this letter with uh, his testimony of, of who he is and what gives him the authority to speak on behalf of Christ. And that's, that's the, the title. We could have just ended here and sung the closing song, but that would not be as fun as me spending three hours going through this with you. So at the, at the end of the Gospel of John, when he's writing about Jesus Christ and his life, in John chapter 20 and verse 31, there he says, uh, but these things are written, John himself is the one who wrote it, it was written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So, you know, sometimes people read it almost as a historical account or uh, something that's just kind of really... Uh, almost like a novel, like what's going to happen next? Oh, that's so wonderful. And, you know, the things Jesus did, the things he taught, the people he touched, he did healing and miracles and raising the dead, and then he died. And, you know, it's kind of a story, but it's not really just a story. It's not just a historical account, although it is historical. Uh, it's not just something that would be informational, although it's packed with a lot of information, but it's hel helping us to come to faith and to believe and to have assurance that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Christ. Jesus is who he claimed to be. And so that's why he wrote uh, the Gospel of John, that we may believe in Jesus and that by believing in him, we may have life because of him. And so at the end of this short letter, 1 John, he says something very similar. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So it seems like the gospel is written to people maybe who don't yet believe, but these things are written that you may believe. It may encourage your belief. But this is saying you already believe. I know you believe, but I want you to know something. I want you to know, even though you believe, to know that you have eternal life. So he's trying to build their faith and even their confidence in the grace of God. I want you to know. So there's got to be some things in the gospel, uh, sorry, in the letter of John that can reassure us of our salvation. Not, not that we wish or we hope we have salvation. Maybe one day we'll find out, uh, but that we can know for certainty that we have eternal life and and. We could find out what that's going to be, but it probably won't be tonight. So this is the way he begins. And so he's trying to, again, build a little bit of credibility for those people that may not even have met him or don't really know him that well. 
So he says, this is 1 John chapter 1, beginning at the very beginning. And again, this is a little different than most of the other letters that were written. Whenever Paul wrote or uh, many of the other uh, writers of the New Testament, they write to people and greetings to the church and uh, may the grace of the Lord be with you and uh, that kind of thing. But he just starts right in at it to introduce himself and introduce Christ. Uh, and so he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at with our hands, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. So the three things that he brings up is, first of all, we've heard Christ. I was there, I heard him speak. He's not just speaking about himself. He says, I, he, he could have said, I heard him speak. Because quite frankly, I think for the most part, um, all the other apostles... Uh, are no longer living when he's writing this. A, a lot of people believe this was written about 90 AD, which is 60 years after Christ died. And most of the other, probably all the other apostles have died uh, by persecution and by execution. Okay, So he's the only one, but he includes all the others that were with Christ. He's not saying, I'm, I'm not the only one that was with Christ, because there's other people you could also look to. We could read the gospel of, or the letter of Peter, right? Or we could read one of the Gospels that also would add to this. I'm not saying all those were in high circulation at this point, but uh, there were other evidences that Christ is who he said he was and that John was a part of that group in that number. So he's saying, we've heard Christ. I was there when I heard him speak. And I've seen what he, he did. Because it's, it's, it's one thing for you to say, well, I, I heard about somebody who did a miracle. Or I saw somebody, just, just, it was just kind of in passing, right? Or I, I sat and I had lunch with somebody. We talked and this is what he said. And I think I really got to know him in, in, in an hour. Uh, probably not. Would, would you say so? Do you really get to know somebody very well in one hour, right? But he's saying, I was with him for a long time. So it's not just a passing, I, I heard something he said as we were crossing paths. We know he was with Christ probably for about three years. So I was constantly hearing. What was he hearing? Well, he was hearing the lessons, hearing parables, hearing Jesus confronting false teachers, hearing Jesus being compassionate to people, hearing the Sermon on the Mount, hearing whenever the apostles asked questions and said, well, what, what about this? And what does this mean? And tell us about this. And Jesus would answer the question. I've heard him speak on a very regular basis. So I've heard him. I've seen him, I've witnessed the things that he did, I was there, and I even touched him, and maybe that will come into a more significant role a little bit later on, because some people are saying, we're, we believe that Jesus came, but we're not sure if he even came bodily. Like, I think maybe he just came as a spirit, and the apostles saw him, and they saw almost like maybe an angelic being, or, you know, some type of a phantom. I mean, he was real, but he was not flesh. And he is eventually going to go on talking about that Christ did come in flesh and blood. He was born, uh, you know, to his mother Mary, right? And he was a little boy and he grew up. And when he died on the cross, you know, he was not a spirit. He was physical in a bodily form. And so Jesus lived in this. So he, I we touched him. It just, because you can't really touch, you know, a ghost or a phantom. We touched him. And so he's saying Jesus is real. The things that I say, I am speaking as a first-hand witness. And that's pretty important, isn't it? I mean, if we were having a court case, I know sometimes people today say, well, forensics, and depending on what the forensic science is, but forensics can carry a lot of weight, but generally a witness who saw the whole thing and is a reliable witness and somebody who's a credible witness, somebody who is an eyewitness, that goes a long way in court, doesn't it? Somebody who says, I was there and I saw it. Now, if your witness is lying or making things up, or if they were not in their right mind when they were witnessing this event, I mean, there could be a lot of things that can go wrong with your witness. But if he is credible, reliable, and an eyewitness, that carries a lot of weight. And, and so James, sorry, John is not saying, it's just me. There's a lot of other witnesses we could refer to, and we can uh, at least see the information they have written, because again, most of them have died. But we were there. And so I'm not making this up. Uh, you know, I'm not talking secondhand. I don't have the issues um, all mixed up. I'm telling you, 
This is what we proclaim. And it's concerning the word of life. Now, of course, he's going to introduce that as Jesus in just a minute. But the word of life. So just kind of starting from there, Jesus is life. He is our spiritual life. He is the only life. And so again, he spends a lot of times in the Gospel of John talking about Jesus is the, the life, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I mean, Jesus constantly refers to himself as the life. And so this is the word of life. And of course, um, the word also comes up quite often in the Gospel of John. You know, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. So the word of life. And so he's talking about Jesus that we were eyewitnesses. So the life appeared, we have seen it, and we testify to it, we proclaim it to you, the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. So again, just say, clarifying to the people, Jesus came from the Father, he came from heaven to the earth, lived among us, now he's ascended, gone back to the Father, he is eternal life, he, he is going to live forever himself, he's providing eternal life for all who want it. So this is the introduction he's giving to the people uh, that are going to be receiving and reading this letter that they would be able to listen uh, to what this apostle has to say. Now he's going to say, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And again, the we would be the people that are preaching the truth, but probably more specifically, all the eyewitnesses that lived in the time of Jesus. Again, not many would be alive, but this is what we proclaim. He's going to go on to say that this is the same message that we've, we've been... This is not new. I mean, you know what? Peter preached back in Acts... And again, I'm quoting Acts 2. He didn't quote Acts 2. I don't think Acts you know, had been all, all put together and distributed back then. But what Peter preached in Acts 2, that's what John's preaching. Right? What the apostles preached in Jerusalem, that's what John is preaching what Stephen preached, what Paul preached, what the other missionaries preached, what, the, what Timothy preached. I mean, we're all preaching the same thing. He's not, I'm not making up anything. This is not a new revelation. It's not a new gospel. It's not a new idea. This is what we've been preaching all along. It's quite similar to what Paul said in Galatians chapter 1. Right? He's saying, we've been preaching the same gospel. As a matter of fact, if anyone preaches a different gospel, you know, don't listen to him. Let him be accursed. I mean, you should not even fellowship with somebody if they're preaching a different gospel. So what is the gospel? Well, the, the gospel is the central, the central teaching of Christ, of, of Christ became flesh. He lived among us as God in the flesh, sinless life, died on the cross that our sins can be forgiven. He was buried. Three days later, he rose, sent it back to the Father. And through Jesus, we have eternal life, right? So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's what Paul says the gospel is, the death and the burial and resurrection of Christ, okay? So that's how we would define somebody who's preaching another gospel. We kind of talked about this a little bit on Wednesday night. There is a little bit of latitude, right, within the faith for people may have a difference of opinion on some issues and even some issues that I may consider a biblical issue a right or wrong issue and they may not see it just like me that doesn't mean that they are accursed and they're damned to hell because they see uh, you know a, a doctrine different than me so one day we can sit down maybe and define all those because some doctrines are essential doctrines they're fundamental and they're foundational doctrines that we need to believe Right? But there are certainly other things that people may uh, not believe or they may believe differently and that doesn't mean that they are not saved. It just means there's a difference of opinion and sometimes there's a difference of interpretation of the Bible. So this is the same gospel we've been preaching. And so what Paul, uh, uh, James is saying is we want to have fellowship together. We want to be able to work together. We want to be able to worship together. Uh, we want to be working in the same direction. And the fellowship, he's saying, is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. So, not only is fellowship with like us each other, but also with God. And that's certainly very important to make sure we're in fellowship with the Lord. Part of being in fellowship with the Lord is being in fellowship with, with, with each other. A, a relational, a family, a, the body of Christ, the church. And so, they're both very important. 
Fellowship with God is really number one. Secondly, we find that the people of God, we can have fellowship with them. And then he says, we write this to make our joy complete. I guess a big question is, who's the our? Is he saying, it's kind of me and, and the other leaders. Our joy is going to be complete if you are fellowshipping with the Father and fellowshipping with us, if you are following the truth, if you're walking in the light and other of these concepts as he's going to talk about, our joy is going to be complete if you, if you are responding and following Christ. And I think any of us who are teachers or maybe even parents, you know, to say, you know, isn't that what Jude says, that, you know, I, I have, uh, um, actually, I think it's Third John. I... I wasn't planning on saying this. Um, you know, I, I have a, a great joy in knowing my children are walking in the faith, right? So it's that kind of joy that we have when, uh, you know, the people that we know and the people we love are following the Lord. So, or is it like not just like our joy up here, but all of our, our, the whole church, all of like you and us and everybody, our joy as a whole, our joy is complete when we are working together and worshiping God together and when we are walking in the light and we're walking in the truth. And this is a, another theme he's going to talk about. So John, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, From the beginning, the word of life, very similar to John, the gospel, 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So a lot of similarities between uh, the gospel of John and this letter of 1 John. So then he goes on to say this in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and we declare to you. So again, you can find this in the gospel of, of John as well. Um, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So he's going to spend some time talking about what this means. If God is light and we're walking in the light, if we are going to be walking in the darkness, we can't be walking in the light. Does that make sense? I mean, you can't have light and darkness together. So light always exposes darkness. So we have light, we walk in the light. If you choose to walk in darkness, you cannot walk in the light. If you choose not to walk in the light, it's automatic you're going to be walking in darkness. Okay? So you really have to make a decision of which path you're going to walk on, you know, if you're going to walk in the light or not. That's a choice that everyone makes. Uh, but he's saying God is light. So if we're going to follow God, we've got to walk, we've got to keep, we've got to remain in the light. And that's, again, another concept he's going to talk about a little bit later on. Jesus said this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but he will have the light of life. So again, Jesus talks about himself being the light a lot in the Gospel of John. But we've got to walk in Christ. And that's why it's important for us to know what Jesus said and what Jesus taught. For us to be reminded, for us to understand, and for us to adjust our life accordingly. That we would follow, not only believe what he said, but to do what he said we need to do. And what that looks like, walking in the light, that's a decision we make, kind of both mentally as well as, excuse me, <coughs> Mentally, as well as um, practicing it, putting it into our lives to walk in the light. And John chapter 12 and verse 46, again, Jesus speaking, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Jesus is the light. The reason he came is so we could live and walk and be blessed by having light, that we can see where we are going, we can have confidence the road that we're on, and that we will get to the place where uh, we want to be. So verse 6 of 1 John 1, again, talking about this fellowship he's already introduced, this being together, being united. If we claim to have fellowship with him, we just finished talking about God is light, but if we claim to have fellowship with him. So some people do this, don't they? Well, I'm a Christian, and, and, and I'm accepted by God, and I'm a child of God, and I'm a follower of God, and I'm saved. But he's saying, even if you say that, 
if you claim to have fellowship with him, if you claim to be a follower, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. So just because someone says they're practicing the truth or teaching the truth or living in the truth, I mean, it could be anybody, right? I mean, sometimes we look at something like this and we say, oh, that's somebody who's not a Christian. I mean, they're far away from Christ. Or if they are a Christian, it's probably somebody who only comes to church, you know, once every other month or something. You know, we just kind of have this idea. It's somebody way out on the fringes, but it could be, it could even be any one of us, couldn't it? That we claim to be in the light, and other people may even think we're in the light, that we are faithful, and that we're following but look what he says. Ye walk, they walk in the darkness. Now, it doesn't mean you stumble in the darkness, because we sometimes can do that, right? We sometimes make bad choices. Sometimes we get off track. Sometimes we lose our way, but, you know, we come back. But if you're continuing to walk, is the idea, continual thing, continue to walk in darkness, and yet you, well, I walk in the light, but you're continually walking in darkness. So you're saying it's hypocrisy at the worst point, Saying one thing and doing the exact opposite. He said, well, that's why he says you lie and you do not live out the truth because your life doesn't match what you claim, what you say, or maybe even what sometimes you believe. You, sometimes people, well, I believe I'm doing the right thing. Well, according to Scripture, you're just not. I mean, you can believe what you want, but the truth is you're not doing what God wants you to do. So this is what his emphasis is, uh, to walk in the light. Now he says, but if we do walk in the light, and again, what is that? That's just a pattern of our life. That doesn't mean we're going to always be walking in the light. It doesn't mean we're going to be perfect in the way we walk. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So again, another big question as we look through this. Um, when we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. So is he talking about, he just finished talking about if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with God and with his son. So is it the fellowship with God and the son? We have, like I have fellowship with God and I, with one another, we have fellowship. Is that what the fellowship is? Or we have fellowship with one another within the body of Christ. That, you know, we can have fellowship with each other, right? Because we're all walking in the same direction. And I probably would say it's both, really, right? When we, are, when we are walking in the light, certainly we have fellowship with God. We're being faithful to Him. And when we walk in the light, we have fellowship with each other because we're all walking in the same direction. So we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. And so that's, again, where He explains, yes, we are still going to sin, uh, we are still going to stumble, we're going to fall, we're going to make bad choices, we're going to make bad decisions, we're going to do some bad things and maybe say some bad things and have some bad attitudes and some bad thoughts. And so sometimes we, we, we stumble into sin, we fall into sin. Sometimes we even make decisions to, to sin. But then when we repent, uh, we come back and it's the blood of Christ that purifies us from all sin. And so this is uh, the message, this is kind of the I would say the key, the primary message that he's trying to share with us as Christians, how can we know for sure that we are in the faith, that we are, you know, as he says near the end of, end of the book in chapter 5, uh, these things are written to assure us of our salvation, to give us confidence of our salvation. Well, it kind of starts right here at the beginning to say, if you're living like this, if this is your your purpose and your direction and your attitude and your commitment, if this is who you're following, you can have assurance because of God's grace, because of the blood of his son, uh, because we've made that commitment to be faithful to him to the very best of our ability. And he has made a commitment to us that he will forgive us of our sins when we seek him and follow him with all of our hearts. And so we all know like that's an ongoing challenge, an ongoing uh, reality in our life. That, that we, we, we seek him, don't always do it as well as we should. He forgives us. 
out of joy and gratitude, we continue to walk in the light, and we, we can be assured that we have eternal life. And it's not because of our performance, and that's the good thing. If it was based on our performance, would anybody here really be sure of their salvation? If it was based on how well we did? Well, probably not. But I can be assured of my salvation based on what Christ has done on the cross. And so it's because of his love and his grace. So we are going to sing a song. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one, lay down. So Christ has come so that we could have freedom and we can have life. We can have assurance of salvation. So we always want to encourage people to have assurance of their salvation and to know Christ personally, make a commitment to follow him and to love him just as he loves us and made so many decisions in his life uh, for us that we could be saved. Let's go ahead and we'll stand this and sing the song and if we can be a blessing, if someone wants to be baptized tonight, we can be baptized into Christ even right now. Let's sing. <laughs>